when I, I'm going to talk about basically all of the words here in this title. Um, there's going to be a bit of a framing I'm going to do of all the practical advice I'm going to give in the middle. And, and also some, some notes I'd like to make. I'm not sure, I mean, first of all, I would like to know how many of you are actually in some way researchers? Okay, great. And like, how many of you are like not in core IT, like in programming, but in something else, like, you know? Okay, that's great. I think we have a good mixture. So, um, first of all, I'm not sure how it was for you, but since Friday the 13th of 2015, I have been to a couple of events, and usually, like I was at a child theater play or something, and they felt obliged to make a note on the Paris attacks, and how we are all against terror and so on. So I'd like to do something similar, but in a different way, because exactly one year ago, when before the attacks, I gave a talk in Paris at a little squad, actually. It was an anarchist tech conference. And um, that talk was about mostly a paper from Jean Youngblood and a talk, a lecture from 2012, I think, in Buenos Aires. And he's a media theorist who has a lot to say about centralization, decentralization, and how media developed in the last 100 years. And his, basically, he's describing something which he calls the broadcast, which is, if you're in Germany, for example, Tagesschau, or if you are in the US, maybe CNN or Fox News and so on, but also a lot more. And what he actually says is all of these news sites, when we actually participate, when we actually listen to this kind of broadcast, we are actually creating ourselves in the image of what is presented to us, right? We are basically becoming part of that. We are sucked into it. And he basically says, if we want to change something, we actually need to secede from this broadcast. We need to do something else. So that's my note on Paris. The, um, just to give a bit of my context, so you can actually interpret what I'm going to say during the talk, I've been, uh, I'm going to say some positive things about EU projects, which is maybe not totally expected. And also I'm even going to say some positive things about um, how money is distributed and how they are trying to do that. And that might be because I, I have participated in three proposals for EU projects and by being lucky, by maybe working with the right people or so, all of them got accepted. Um, so that's going to taint my view on this probably a bit. It's all great and you know, it's like easy and whatnot. The other thing is that I also, since about 20, 25 years, I um, co-created and, and still maintain several open source projects. And I also participated in co-creating for like 10, 12 years or so a community space, which is like owned by the people that live there and with lots of uh, many interesting things happening there uh, here in Germany. So that's some of my background. Um, when you think of the EU what you're, and the funding and this 80 billion, it's actually 78 billion number, you are actually Probably, and that's also what, how I was introduced, like how to make money fast, how to make it like for free, to just get it, right? And I think that um, this thing that basically money is an end in itself, like you just, you know, we just get it and we are happy to just have it and, and do it. It's on the one hand, I think it's fine. I kind of like can sympathize with that. On the other hand, I think um, this, this whole notion of believing so much in these numbers, like transferring some bits from one computer to another and having like all of society ordered by this, is a bit odd. So when you look up in this Bitcoin coin, there is a, an engravement that says uh, vires in numeris. And that means strength or power or something, strength in numbers. 
And you can tell also probably not only for the Bitcoin people, but also for the IT community, which has grown like crazily in the last decade. There's a strong belief based in, in this in numbers, like in counting, you know, in measuring, in measuring also popularity and, and all this. And there's also a long criticism of looking at numbers and trying to understand society and other people by, um, by putting numbers to them. One of the first persons who actually um, discussed this is like 2,300 something years ago. And that guy was Aristotle. He's still like many of the things that they were discussed at that point, they're still kind of prevalent in our thinking, like in many areas. One of the areas that he actually already discussed was what does money do with a society? And one of the advices he gives, like it's a, it's a longer thing that a friend of mine actually just gave his um, talk to become a philosophy professor on this particular topic. And I learned a lot by, by listening to him and understanding that already Aristotle had this thing about focus on the use value of money. Like, how can you use it to actually do something and not on the exchange value, like just like amassing money? And you saw this tendency like already in <coughs> Athens, like two and three, uh, 2000 and a bit years ago. My, like 11 days ago, my, my child, at the time I was preparing the talk and I was thinking about Aristoteles and talking to a friend about it, he, I came into his room and um, he built this bridge just by himself. He found some money somewhere, you know, and he built this bridge and he wanted to basically, I think it's a good picture and it actually captures also part of what Aristotle said because you're basically trying to get to another place. You want to have a new system, you want to have a new understanding, you want to have like different ways how we organize. <coughs> and on your way, you, you need some money to actually do this. But the thing is not about the money, it's actually about getting somewhere else. Okay. So with that all being said, let's get to the money. Um, the program, the research program, there's, there's many EU programs. The biggest one in history is the current research program, which is called Horizon 2020. It started in 2014, it's lasting seven years. And if you break down the numbers, it means that for each day, they spend 30 million on research projects, right? Like each day, like during the course of this conference, they spend three times four, 120 million. A bit more expensive than this conference, I guess. Um, previously, we could basically fly to the moon with this money, right? We could, um, we could get, get very far. The whole Apollo program, like from the inception in terms of research to actually building the rockets, testing the rockets, actually flying to the moon, all the trainings, everything was done with a similar amount of money, I would argue, because we should be, it should be a lot easier today to actually do something like this with all the great technology we have. Except it seems we are not even able to, to build an airport in Berlin anymore. <laughs> You know, but it's okay. <laughs> um, one of the persons actually involved in that research that was successful with the Apollo was uh, Margaret Hamilton. And she was the director for doing the software for the onboard flight system. So when the thing actually approached the moon, they programmed. And the program is actually this paperwork, right? It's this staple, it's assembler. And the even though this program was a lot of paperwork, they had a relatively free organization of how they researched. Like people got together, discussed certain problems, went off to do something and so on. So there wasn't like a lot of hierarchy. It's the same way how they did it with the Manhattan Project to build um, the atomic bomb. And it's the same way they, I think, created uh, laser systems, for example. Back in the days, in the 50s, they actually just got like lots of people who are capable, basically, according to some criteria, and they just got them together and said, go, you know, the goal is this, organize yourself how to get there. That's not how it's happening anymore. 
So the, the paperwork that we have today is, um, we are like deep into bureaucracy and I think that's the last general framing thing I'd like to do. Um, the one book is very is discussing basically the development of research uh, from David Graeber um, in, I think it appeared in this year, earlier this year. It's called The Utopia of Rules and he discusses how bureaucracy is like the dominant model. And it doesn't matter if you were in living in uh, East Germany, Soviet Russia, or, or like in the US or so, or in Germany. It's all the same. Like the, the bureaucracy uh, topic is there and it's developing. And I even argue that, and you can talk to me about this afterwards, that the software we are building and the IT systems we are building are actually prolonging and deepening this bureaucracy. So there's tons of people in call centers and everywhere who are basically driven by software. They just they basically just put a voice to an algorithm. They have no agency left. And that's what you get, like if you have a total ordering by bureaucracy, like there's no agency, there's no, nobody can decide anything, it's all driven by rules, right? And th there seems to be something that we find fascinating about this. It's like, we like to, it's impersonal. It's not like, it doesn't depend on the size of my nose. It's, it's like nice, I can just go there and, and, and get, get what I deserve, you know, according to some rules. But it does kill agency, and I think it's a big problem that extends even further than what he's talking about. Okay, so let's get to the practical parts. Information communication technology is the one thing that uh, incorporates, I think, about 18, 20% of the budget of the Horizon program. And it's, it's basically about all the things that are going on here at the conference in, in, various, um, in various forms. And what I found it interesting that, um, I mean, the EU is kind of a market liberal organization. That's kind of well known. Um, but there's also other aspects like like the, the, the main, the overarching goal, what they state, is actually to do something with a tangible benefit for European citizens, not for companies. You know? I mean, the way they want to achieve that is actually going through companies, but the idea, and that you can see that actually in many calls, is actually going a bit deeper. So they are very open now to open source stuff, to grassroots stuff, it even appears like in calls. You know, if you're doing some grassroots stuff, like Freifunk, for example, also received funding and other people. So there really, there's an opening there, which is actually, I think, already in the, in the main goal. They have six um, main activity areas. And one thing that is also apparent, if you actually read some of the meta docs uh, in, of this um, ICT strategy, it's not very long, I think it's good to read it, is that they see that software is eating the world. It's like everywhere. And that also means that there's a different responsibility. And that also means that we need to have something interdisciplinary. IT people cannot hope to like, have a good understanding, even though, like, for example, the Bitcoin people tend to do this, to have a good understanding how human history actually evolved, you know, anthropology and things like this. And David Graeber, which I, um, which I mentioned earlier, he is an anthrop anthropologist. And he actually knows like about various aspects of the last 5,000 years of human development that are like well researched. They are grounded actually in research. Whereas when you find IT people talking about society, you often get a very like kind of simplistic view. And I think that stems from the fact that we, um, IT got so important that we somehow feel we are like, you know, we know what's happening. We can tell the world how, how things are going on because of this importance of IT and you get lots of money and whatnot. So I think there's a certain danger there. I'm going to get back to that at the end. Um, anyway, these six areas combined with interdisciplinarity um, are actually a description of what is going on here at the conference, right? I mean, all of these things here happen at the conference. So it's on that level, it's, I think, a perfect match. <coughs> so let's look at how does it actually work. 
the, what I call the application environment or the terms you need to know when you actually go for an application. Uh, I'm going to, to go into this a bit. Um, but I'd like to make one note before the, the main way how, how the projects I, I'm involved in started was by personal relations, talking to people, not talking to companies, talking to people who were doing some interesting stuff, right? And when you have this network, and this is like a perfect opportunity, like last year, I literally went around the conference and talked to random people I didn't know before. Of course, you all know some people, or at least most of you will know some people, but it's a great idea to just talk to random people um, and, and find something out, you know, and, and do some networking there. So, the application for the um, EU. What the ICT publishes is a two-year work program. They want to program society, and they publish calls. And the calls are kind of brief. They're like one page, or maybe one and a half pages. They have all kinds of keywords in them, like they are about doing new distributed systems, new, they had a big call uh, like this year for digital social platforms. Like I think 200 million or something they spent on building new digital social platforms. And these calls are basically the, they are usually published in advance like three months ago and they stem from things in the work program. So by looking at the work program for the next two years, you can actually get an idea of what they're going to publish calls on. And maybe if you know some people or attend, or have someone in your context attend something of the networking events, which are actually kind of nice, like in Brussels or so, you will get some more information on when a call is actually upcoming before. And what you do then, if you already like know people who are interested in a particular topic, you need to form, you need to do two, two things. You need to write a proposal that needs to get accepted and you need to form a consortium, a consortium of companies and other organizations that can be non-profit organizations, that can be universities or research institutes and so on, or your own um, companies. The, when you actually, within this three month, there's a deadline, uh, when you submit your proposal as a consortium, then it gets evaluated. And finally, which is now quite quick, like 10 years ago, it used to take like nine months, now it's like three months. So usually like three months after submission, you know if you're accepted or not. A note about small companies, something that changed, which I find very positive <coughs> for personal reasons, is that um, 10 years ago, the funding was 50%. So the EU basically gave, let's say 200,000, but you had to come up with another 200,000. I had to show that you actually spent 400,000. And to make it easier for small companies, they actually now give 100% funding. So you get all of that, plus 25% overheads. So if you're getting, for example, 100,000 per year as a small company, you still get 25,000 for overheads, like accounting and managing some stuff and so on. So that's actually a big, I think, very positive change because it means that actually small companies can, like, like myself, for example, 10 years ago, I was a one-person company, more or less. Um, then I had some employees and I thought, well, maybe subcontracting is better or not working at all is even, even much better. And then um, I'm not, I'm, I'm also had my, my small company and I, this time uh, I was again a one-person company, which was kind of fine. I mean, there's people getting employed and stuff like this, but they're kind of very flexible about this. 10 years ago, it was a big fight. So that's, a, I would say, a positive message. Also, the paperwork is much better now. Um, it's a bit hard to actually authenticate to the system that requires like some overhead yeah, um, ahead, but otherwise, registering as a company and stuff like this is basically a matter of half a day or day or something. Um, when you write a proposal to whatever entity, then you need to know how the evaluation is done. They have three criteria, and for each of the criteria, they give five points. It's excellence. That means how the project you're envisioning, the objectives you have in your project, um, need to discuss the state of the art. Like, what is currently in that field where you are doing something? 
What is the state of the art? And then, how do you go, how do you intend to go beyond it? Like, what are you doing? What are you trying to do with this research project? And it needs to be risky. It needs to be bold. Like, not, I'm doing a small increment improving, like, this subsystem. That's not enough. Like, it needs to be, like, something that spans over, like, two, three years and involves maybe, like, ten people working on the project and, and being on the edge of research. That's the idea. Impact is the, basically the market liberal aspect because they basically perceive the succession or the improving of society through funding, uh, creating a <coughs> European market and strengthening the European market against the evil Asians and the evil US and even the Brazil and whatnot, you know? So it's kind of like this thinking you will find and Basically, you need to make an argument how this is relating to market activities, how something actually, this research might be uh, the basis for some products to be developed and some further activities that are economic. You know? And then um, the third criteria, uh, criterion is quality and efficiency. And that refers to how well do you actually allocate the money between the partners? How well are the, the, the people who are involved in the project qualified to actually do this work? Is there some kind of, basically you need to create some trust that you're not just having some grand idea, but you can actually execute it, you can actually do it. So basically this is where you bring in past open source projects, past other projects you did, and, um, and the scientists also that are, needs to be involved because you also need to publish papers, but not only, I mean, that's only just one aspect. Um, they also need to have some um, track record, or that helps at least. <clears throat> the evaluation process, I think, is actually somewhat, like I said, I mean, one of these positive statements, actually somewhat reasonable. It's when you send in your proposal, it gets disclosed to independent reviewers. These are people who are not employed by the European <coughs> Union, they actually get a day a honorarium of 450 euros. And um, they get sent, nowadays, uh, they used to actually convene in some room where, which was sealed. Now it's actually allowed before that they get the proposals remotely. So they can actually do internet research, which they couldn't do before. They're going to cross-check what you're saying in your proposal against like the real world. Right? And um, the, these independent reviewers also independently give three times up to five points. Excellence, how well are you going beyond state of the art? Impact, how it's like helping the economy? Quality, <laughs> like how you're faring there. They give up to five points for each. It gets summed up. And if two reviewers who are reviewing the same proposal disagree, they need to talk to each other and either convince each other or I think the average is taken, I'm not sure. But I think they can get a chance. Like if someone says, well, quality is really just three out of five and the other says, no, it's actually five. It's because blah, blah. And then they can actually maybe say four or they even agree on five. It's like this is an independent process um, between these two reviewers. And maybe there might also be, I'm not sure about this, there might also be other reviewers who then also look at this in case of conflicts. That changes also a bit, and it depends also a bit on the call. The accumulation of these points is up to 15, and there's no threshold. So it's not like if you have 13, you are accepted or something, or 14, or 15, not even 15, basically. It depends on the number of proposals for the particular call. So if you have 30 proposals, and you have five projects which can get accepted. The typical sum is two million, but it can be also five, but typical is like two, three million for a consortium. Um, you will get five projects in there, and you have 30 proposals, and then basically the highest ranking ones first take up the positions. So maybe it's 14 points or 13 points that are enough that depends on the number of proposals and the budgets and so on. You also have to know that there's a whole industry trying to grab this money. So there's various companies actually offering um, services to write proposals. So about what I know from many people 
in the area, about half the proposals are basically not acceptable at all. Because either they are very well written, because that, that has been done professionally by people who do this like for the 20th time or so, but there's no content, right? There's no excellence, basically. It's like lots of buzzwords, but you know. And then you have actually also the other extreme where it's like a very ambitious project, but it's like impossible to understand what they're actually trying to do. <laughs> you know, well, then on, or the structure of their work is like implausible or something like this. And they are, many people actually resubmit, they just try again, they modify it a bit, maybe a slightly different consortium, do it again. These are about half the proposals and they're typically, so actually you only have, if you actually pass these two barriers, then you only have like 10 to 15 competitors. So then the chances actually increase. Um, yes, so that's I think, well, the thing is, it's very easy to criticize, I mean, as a gated community, it's very easy to criticize um, the EU with all the bureaucracy and you know, all the power structures and the hidden agendas and whatnot. And I think that's not entirely fair um, because I've been involved also in program committees, <coughs> like doing, um, accepting talks and so on. And these were community conferences. And I can say from my own experience that the selection process is in many places kind of random. It depends on some people t taking a stance and claiming this is a great talk or that's a great person who holds the talk and so on and it's not really a transparent process. I mean the typical mail you get when you submit something to a conference including the 32C3 is, yeah we are sorry there were so many interesting proposals uh, so we had to choose and it was really hard and blah, blah, and we took like every effort and so on and so on and then cheers, see you, you know? No information actually. No information on, uh, okay, what aspect, you know? Is it like the topic is not interesting or like couldn't you understand what I want to actually do in this talk or something like this? Whereas with the, thanks. Whereas with the uh, EU, we actually get the numbers. You see, okay, they actually thought the excellence is there. Right? It's like five points, great. So the highest score you can reach. They think there's even a good impact, maybe it's four. And they think the quality is actually just three. And they actually even sometimes have sentences explaining why they think it's three. So it's actually somewhat useful feedback because it means when you get like excellence five, for example, that you can stick to the idea and maybe resubmit, but actually have to work a bit more on <coughs> other contexts. Uh, and other areas of your proposal, or the other way around. I know, for example, there's a very interesting project. I know some people there I'm not directly involved called the Interplanetary File System. It's about a decentralized web, and, and many people actually in several conferences have been very interested in this. There have been nine talks submitted to this conference from, indie, from multiple people, and they have been all rejected, and they have no clue why. Right, so this whole thing, the EU is bad and they're doing their, they're intransparent and so on. I think it's, it's also good to look a bit like, are we actually really saying, okay, if you give me this, I can give you this and so on. It's a, it's a difficult thing, actually, if you actually put yourself into the position there. When you actually get accepted in a call with your proposal, then, of course, the, the thing is actually carrying out the project. And because you have to do planning so far ahead, like three, three four years, actually, when you start with envisioning the project up until completion, it's four years. Who can foresee four years of their life? Um, then the kind of collaboration you do there and the kind of people you pull into the project, how you deal with somebody you know, falling out because he or she gets a child or something happens and so on, and then you have to deal with all of that as well. And of course, you have to, you have to deliver the only legally binding things you promised to the EU, 
which are, like you have this 60 page proposal, which is typical, and there's like 15 pages, which are your work packages. So you actually say, okay, we have these six work packages, that's also a typical thing. <coughs> there's multiple partners, there's usually a lead partner in each work package, and we have, for this work package, three deliverables. A research paper on this, a release of this software on that, and whatever. And you have this for all of the work packages. And these deliverables, they are the legal promises that you do. <coughs> so if you don't produce this, you will get a problem actually getting all of the money. Or like you get prepayment, and then you have to pay it back. And that actually happens, like it happens. But it's kind of unusual. So basically in your proposal, you give all of the context that is important to understand the work packages, and the work packages are the primary, and the deliverables are then, the, for the reviewers, the primary focus of attention. They look at this, like how much money per work package, what are the various aspects, how does it all relate to each other? Does it look like each partner is just doing their own thing, and they actually try to avoid to talk to each other and just want to get their project through and stuff like this? You know, this is actually what they look at, like how many partners are involved. Do they actually intend to collaborate and so on? And then, of course, you also have to do financials and reporting. And I can say that, yes, it's a bit of effort, but it's not actually insurmountable. I have been with national programs in Germany, and they have, well, I hope nobody's listening there. I'm not actually intending to go. <laughs> it hasn't been as, uh, actually, the EU, this Horizon or this framework program, I think, has a lot of rational, let's put it positively, a lot of rational processes. So also when, um, for example, when one partner actually can't provide the, the work because somebody dropped out who was like qualified to do it, then shifting some budget to another partner is actually quite possible. And this is where the initial trust and the, the people relations come in. Because if, if you have a discussion in the consortium between companies who actually distrust each other, which happens a lot, then something like shifting budget to reach a goal is going to be very hard. And that can only be prevented, I think, by people actually you know, somewhat trusting each other, that they don't just you know, want to grab money and don't want to give anything and contribute and so on. That's really something that you can resolve on the people level. So an example now for the current call that a number of people I'm involved with um, went in and, and actually got it, and it's starting in January, was that, and this is an example of the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary tone and aspect that is in many, and I think it's very important, and it makes a lot of sense, uh, in many ICT, information communication technology stuff, just like here at the conference, basically. Um, they wanted to have something, um, a research project that actually does technological developments, addressing, um, anonymity, ethics, privacy preservation, and so on. So obviously a topic that is tied in part at least also to, to a reaction also within parts of the EU people regarding Snowden. It actually goes back to that, right? So they thought, okay, something needs to be done there. And what we did like, a number of people got together. Uh, the first meeting I was involved in is like a year ago, and the, um, Sorry, no, a year and two or three months. And then the, the actual thing where more people got together was here at the 31C3, like at two o'clock in the night, walking out of the party hall, running into the persons, and ah, we wanted to talk about this. Okay, let's talk about this. Um, and then, you know, these were like three different people from three different countries, which is also important, and kind of three different contexts. Contexts. So we got together and we had heard that there's going to be a call, and it was, about this. So we applied for that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Right, uh, sorry. This is the project we applied with. Did I actually show this slide? Right. Um, this is the call. That, that is part of the text of this one-page call. And we said, great. You know, we just take this and focus on this. Because there's lots of things in this call, but you basically, are going to tell your story from a part of the call and say, okay, this is what we're going to focus on. And that's what we did. We actually said, okay, and it's, it's stated a bit boldly, um, 
also to make it clear, like the people involved here um, want to research into decentralized um, interdisciplinary and privacy preserving and so on uh, technologies and protocols, actually develop new protocols. So there's various peer-to-peer -peer protocols and um, messaging protocols, including also more transparent encryption for email and, and lots of other things that are in this project. And also community research, like trying to understand why or how decentralization projects can <coughs> succeed in the current market environment that we have, right? Which is not a trivial problem. Um, so, um, another project, I'm just going to mention this briefly, um, is the PyPy project. I actually talked about this in 2005, I think, also at a CCC conference. Um, it's just in time compiler for Python, and it was EU funded for three years. The project existed already one or two years, like between persons that actually at some point decided, okay, this is an interesting call, like new language design or something, what it was. And we went for that. We got three years of fun, three years funding, one or three million or something like this. And the thing is, and that's also why the EU is happy about this project as a reference, is it's actually still ongoing, like in 2015. And that's not the typical things that happens with EU projects. They exist at, like, with the beginning of the funding and they end when it's done and then there's nothing. Then sometimes even the web page is gone, you know? <laughs> and you can imagine that many, like, many people, the project officers who are responsible for projects, they're kind of unhappy about this. They want to have something that actually has an impact, that actually goes on. And, they basically try to, like, they pump some money into it to actually help it. And you don't have to pay it back. It's not a loan or something. But it's actually for getting somewhere and not just for getting the money. So I think the key, again, is, like, the, the people and the project you want to do, the project idea, the vision, is really what needs to come first. And basically also wanting to do it even without EU funding. That's a good start, I think. And then you basically are even more happy when the project actually, when you actually get the funding and can sustain yourself. One thing that is important is uh, what is very helpful, 10 years ago, I haven't used it that much now because I have other means of getting at information, but um, in each country in Europe, there's a so-called national contact point. In Germany, it's called the NKS. It's actually with the you know, moon landing, the, the um, Raumfahrt, the, what's it called, airspace, no, um, uh, space, travel. space travel, right? Space travel agency of Germany. They are also functioning as um, as a contact point. The thing about contact points is the national contact points. They are usually super helpful. They are not employed by the European Union. They are actually representing the nation states, and they want to help the entities in their country to get the largest piece of the cake as possible, <laughs> right? So don't be afraid to talk to them. When you talk to someone from the European Union, it's often a lot harder um, to get useful information. I think it's partly to the rules they are actually um, executing. They had a big scandal of corruption 10 years ago, uh, or 12 years ago now or so, and they changed the rules. And I, I think it's still in effect, but don't name me on this. Um, it was at least for a very long time. A project officer that tells a project something, like, yeah, yeah, you can make this change, it's going to be okay. <coughs> you know, you, you ask for some change you want to make, and they said it's okay. And you, you quote them on this, and you sue them on this, because later on, basically, when you actually do the change, and it gets not accepted by the legal department <coughs> of the EU, then this project officer is liable with at least one year salary, personally. And you can imagine what, I mean, what this kind of situation does to your, like, giving good advice, right? It's a bit tricky. Like, when you say something and you do it, and then there's always this um, tension. And I think it's not a very good idea, but they try to actually make it harder for project officers to um, do harm to the EU budget. Okay, um, I also said hacking funding. Um, 
I already mentioned when I talked about bureaucracy that I think there's a certain relation between software and bureaucracy. Both deal with categories, both deal with like confining the world into certain like pieces and making relations and so on. It's just that software automatically executes and, um, and the bureaucracy that we know, at least it's changing actually, but it's, it's, it's executing by, executed by humans. When I say hacking funding, I mean um, hacking in the sense of uh, understanding. Like you understand how something works, how the process works, how the rules are executed, what is involved, like the, the various pieces. And then the other part of hacking is trying to use it for a good purpose, sometimes also a bad purpose, right? But in general, trying to, let's say for your own purpose, and it's your choice. Um, <clears throat> decentralization. How is it possible that the EU, as a kind of a centralist institution, um, funds decentralization. Like, how is, how is that logic or something, right? And I'm not going to do, go too deep into this, but I, I mean, there's, there's several things you can say about this. The one thing is that the many people in the EU, they are not happy with all these nation states. And they, to put it very bluntly, they think that maybe decentralization is a way the Europe of regions or other things to actually you know, get a more coherent thing and not so much focus on the nation states. So it's basically a backdoor to, to change culture and stuff like this. The other thing is there's an intrinsic relation between centralization and decentralization. And it depends on the context you look at. Um, YouTube is a socially decentralized system. I can choose which kind of videos I like to. Um, Google Hangouts, I can choose whom to hang out with. Facebook, I can choose which kind of friends I make. But of course, because we have this X-ray thing, we like look through this and say, well, but it's all done by one entity who controls everything. That doesn't mean that the social experience isn't actually very socially decentralized. And that has been going on for a long time. And one of the holy grails, basically, of um, of IT development is to make it finally possible that it doesn't need to be owned by, by a single entity. Like such platforms can actually be collaboratively done, right? And, and exist basically on, on, on all of our devices without, and we collaborate and we maybe even have contracts how we do things, but there's no need to actually have like this commercial entity that tries to capture all the value in terms of money between, uh, between social interactions. And um, so, but in the end, like what most users actually experience, and that's really something where you need to be very careful when you talk about decentralization, most users actually feel they're decentralized. I have my mobile, I can contact whoever I want. So decentralization on that level is like the direct experience is actually decentralized. It's only the problem that we know how it's actually operated, right? And that's understandable, but I think it's important to, to not think that people just don't understand. They understand perfectly well. It makes sense for them. So I think when it comes to also this conference and also the IT community in general, we have this, and the topic is gated communities, we have the Vatican problem, right? It's always this Vatican problem. We're kind of like, not so much at this conference, I mean, this is not, I've been to other programming conferences um, where it's much stronger. Um, we are kind of like the bishops and, you know, discussing the world and, and having ideas about grand, like, unifying theories, how everything must be done and so on. Um, but there's only certain aspects of it here. Um, and the other is like more uh, horizontal, like hippie-like, whatever, and diverse approach where you don't have a single ruling idea, right? You maybe have a single platform, like this conference, with lots of rooms and lots of possibilities, but then what actually happens is, again, completely decentralized, like it's up to us, who we talk to, how we, got, um, how, how we go about things. And um, how this resolves, I mean, how can we 
How can we get away from, I would also say, bureaucratic systems that rob people of agency? Um, that's a big question. And I, I think there's a number of people, even in the like, project offices in the EU, who actually want to help us, right? So, and they are actually explicitly interested, I know this from at least one person, in getting more interesting projects, especially from contexts from like the CCC, right? So that's definitely something to go for. So finally, I just made this picture this morning. It's very nice it's because we have this more or less horizontal activities with a little of, bit of like, you know, big keynotes and stuff and stuff um, and, like in, and the big room stuff. Um, and I think it's all a bit in the shadow of what Gene Youngblood called the broadcast, right? We have this big overarching broadcast that basically tries to order all of the world and integrate all of the activities into a certain, what Gene Youngblood calls, world system. And that's a certain tension that I feel personally. And since the Paris attacks, I actually I didn't want to read any of this like this whole thing, what they say in the Tagus show, or you know, all the politicians and so on, I said, okay, this is now a perfect opportunity to actually not listen to the broadcast anymore. So I stepped away from all of this, like be it Spiegel, be it whatever. I mean, all of these um, broadcast media, because I don't want to recreate myself in this image that they're painting, to be part of that, right? I want to create my own contexts. I want to have the time and maybe also the calm to actually to do this and go somewhere else. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Holger, for this very nice talk. Uh, we have 10 minutes for Q&A, so if you have a question, please line up at the four microphones. Uh, while you're lining up, we also have a question from our signal angel on IRC. There is the question uh, whether there are some examples available from the paperwork submitted, like the 60 pages of maybe the successful uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think there are. Um, I'm not sure sometimes they are only the everything except for the budgeting, like how the money is distributed. That's so, and then, I mean, there are basically hundreds out there. Um, if you send me a mail, I can probably make you available at least two or three. And I'm not sure if there's a public repository, but it's, it's a very good point because um, looking at successful proposals, ideally some that got 15 out of 15 points, to see how they are done, it's a certain structure. There's like three chapters, excellence, impact, like how you're doing the stuff, right? And um, you can see this, how it's done and how people actually describe things. Um, in examples, uh, I, I, like I said, I'm not completely sure about um, a repository, but also ask at the national contact point, um, or if all else fails, try to mail me and I can see what I can provide. And since you're following the topic, um, do you also maybe blog about it? Uh, <laughs> I'm not following the topic, I'm just getting some money. Um, <laughs> I, I see the use value in this. So I'm not an expert on this. Like, uh, I'm, not one of, I'm not operating a company that does advice on this, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not using Twitter currently, but um, I might post something on the blog. I can't promise. Sorry. Yes? Uh, on Hello? On Twitter, there's actually a link for a uh, proposal which was uh, submitted successfully uh, about open peer. And mm -hmm. for anybody who is doing open data, there's currently a new project uh, running where the call will last uh, till August 2016, where you can get up to 100,000 if you're doing open data projects. So mm -hmm. that might be useful yes. for some people. Yeah, I mean, one thing I can offer is that the people who are interested to discuss a bit more in depth, we can actually gather afterwards and go somewhere and talk a bit more about examples and some background information. Yes. Question from the microphone. Question from the 
Um, I, I want to know, you said there was PyPy as an example. You have any, do you know of any other projects that might be known, perhaps, that got successfully funded and that people yes. know and use? I mean, there's, there's increasingly many open source projects, but I think Fryfunk was involved. I'm not sure about how it was called, Mesh something. Somebody here who knows? No. Um, there's, um, there's the open data. There's also, I think, activities in the open data community. And if you look for open source EU funded project, you should find some examples. And I think it's just getting more. Like, I, I still remember that PyPy was one of the first bigger ones they actually funded with open source. Because there's this section in your proposal about intellectual property rights, right? Like, how many patents do you actually plan to submit and stuff like this? And you were like, zero, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's, uh, I think it's more usual now. Like, they understand open source and they want to have it. So there's not really a, a big barrier there at all anymore. Another question from the front right microphone. Uh, would you tell us something more about consortiums and consortium dynamics, uh, especially what kind of consortium dynamics uh, founders are looking for? Like, uh, I, I don't know, just for, as an example, if you like to play role-playing games, you know, you always, you always need a cleric, a warrior, and a wizard. <laughs> what do you need for a consortium? <laughs> <laughs> You already said it, I think. <laughs> I know at least one or two persons who were involved in EU projects that would, would consider kind of wizards that actually made things happen. Uh, yeah, there's also the warriors that actually try to fight for their budget and don't want to do actually much. Oh, we didn't deliver in the last year. Yeah, but we want to have the money anyway. And then you have this discussion in the consortium and. You can either decide, okay, how we're going to justify this to the EU, or you can put pressure on this um, entity, and that all um, depends a bit. So it's, um, I think there's a m number of examples, and that's when you talk to people at universities, you will get a lot of negative uh, experiences, right? Um, but I think it depends on how you do it. I think the, if you actually have people who want to do something together, that's like, it's like half, at least, or 70% of your success, right? If you have, uh, if you see it all through the lens of like companies and their budgets and, you know, the CEOs talking also, I would say that's, uh, yeah. I mean, I can, I, I can talk maybe uh, off the records of some disasters I know. <laughs> Another question from the front left microphone. It's not a question, it's actually an answer. There is no central repository of proposals, but okay. we published our winning proposal in entirety at opencare.cc, and it got like 14.5 out of 15. So come and talk to us if you, um, if can you, you need some Can you say a bit more about your project, actually, because you're, some people asked? Um, okay, so it's uh, we're looking at um, community-driven models of health and social care. So what mm -hmm. would a health and social care system look like if it were driven by communities wielding open technology and access to basically um, knowledge that was only accessible to either the market providers or the state? Mm -hmm. So um, the whole proposal, just go to opencare.cc, mm -hmm. download it, including the budget, whatever, everything we sent in. Cool. And come talk to us. We're also at uh, the Ed Riders Assembly. Ah, cool. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So you see, it's, it's actually possible, you see? <laughs> Another question from the front right microphone. Um, a little more informational question about how is small company defined in the EU? How, how you, does you a small in, uh, for small companies easier to apply because the barrier is lower? So how is small company defined? How many employees or? Ma I think they are also fine with one-person companies. Like I said, I mean they don't want to have a consortium. I'm pretty sure of seven one-person companies. They're not going to go with that. So you have to have a kind of a mixture. Okay. And there's one thing I didn't say clearly, uh, which is there's one company which is. Uh, the ringmaster, um, which is the coordinator. 
company. And that is the primary contact of the EU. And that usually needs to be some institution that knows how to deal with this EU interaction. So the EU usually much prefers having an experienced company there. It also usually wants to have a university or two, and then companies. But some of the companies can be very small. That's fine. Microphone front left. Yes. Thanks. Um, in the case of, of this um, criteria um, impact, I'm wondering um, how difficult it is for, for projects about privacy or for social good to argue here. So in the case of the Next Leap project, how mm -hmm. did you argue that there's an economic benefit? Well, we basically stated that there is a demand for privacy preserving technology, um, but it's currently too hard to actually get something usable. And so it's also part of the project is about usability and um, also developing basically the core open source technologies in order to build products with it. And um, there's also, I mean, there's various applications that have millions of downloads, even on mobile phones and so on, that are privacy preserving today. So it's, you can make the case, basically, that um, doing something in this area, maybe also relating it to opinion polls, like public opinion polls, um, has an impact on a tangible benefit for European citizens, right? And you can also make this, and we did this argument that it can actually also help, it will also help um, product development that people can it's actually... Help, it's helping the citizens, it's okay, it's not, must not help only the market. Um, no, no, I mean, okay. market needs to be in there. Like I said, I mean, that's just the framing we are in is, the broadcast we are in is actually market liberal. So um, you can probably go, I mean, market liberal is also kind of a big range, right? I mean, some people focus more on the liberal part and some people more on the market part. And I think you have some freedom there in how you exactly describe it, but you must relate to it. The impact is also about economics. Um, we have time for a few more quick questions from the front right microphone. I'm sorry. Uh, can you um, please repeat the, the question? Does the, does the country where you're incorporated in matter in getting funding? Yes. You need to have European companies usually. You need to, no, and sorry. You need to have companies who are incorporated in the EU and plus some associated member states. I think Switzerland is also possible and some others. And there's also some programs that deal with collaboration with Japan, you know, going all the way back to the Second World War. Um, and <laughs> well, no, that's not really. No, I'm just wondering why it's Japan. Why not something else? I mean, whatever. Um, yeah, but inside, and, it's, inside and, it's, and it's Brazil. And I think, but otherwise, basically, the main carriers of um, the main carriers of of the the main carriers of the consortium need to be in Europe. You can employ people from other countries, like uh, from the U.S., and we're doing this. But so we actually get them. They don't mind because it's kind of like getting good people here is a good idea. Sorry. But there's not like a higher likelihood to get funding if you're, for example, from Germany. Or no, it's, I only know that Germany somehow manages uh, to get uh, above proportional payback. Um, I don't know if there's how they do this, <laughs> or if it's just because there's more proposals. I think there's a quite big support industry in, in, in Germany. Um, and also, I think, a lot of activities, actually, that qualify. But, um, yeah, it's... It's, there's no, I think, sometimes there are, there are calls that explicitly say we want to have at least one participant from Greece or from Spain or, you know, some, some category. So there are sometimes special conditions on the calls that actually do this, but usually it's the whole of the EU and you need to have usually three different countries involved. We're all out of time. Thank you very much, Holger, for this very insightful talk. Please give him a warm round of applause.